Okay, everyone, please welcome Harold Welt to be talking about open source mobile communications. <laughs> yeah, hi, everyone. That was uh, quite an adventurous uh, beginning of the talk. Uh, never happened before. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about um, open source mobile communications and uh, particularly the Osmocom project. Um, which uh, some of you may have heard about uh, before in various different uh, contexts. And uh, before I'm going to talk about the various sub-projects and the various uh, focus areas in which we uh, work inside the Osmocom project, um, I'd like to take a little bit of a step back and um, compare um, different communication worlds or different communication systems um, sort of to reflect um, the journey that uh, we've gone through through the last uh, uh, well uh, eight years by now. So I'm um, going to skip the slide about myself. Basically, I've been doing uh, Linux and, and uh, uh, networking uh, related stuff for quite some time. Um, and if you have a background in TCP IP, the internet world, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, whatever, then it's basically to, to you it's normal that all the stuff you want to use is open source or at least you can find everything in open source. So basically, let's say you want to do some research in the TCP IP world. Um, well, you use off the shelf hardware like an x86 PC, which has an Ethernet card built in these days. Um, you start with uh, Linux or a BSD operating system, which has the entire protocol stack and the drivers and everything open source. You add whatever instrumentation you need. Um, you do some modifications. Let's say you have a bright idea how to optimize TCP congestion control or something like that. Um, you do testing and you write a paper and publish the results and um, this is why we have been seeing such an enormous amount of innovation in the TCP IP and internet world um, over the last uh, whatever 25 years or so um, and we haven't seen that in uh, the cellular space uh, to the same extent. So assume it's 2009, which is basically before we really got started in the Osmocom project and you want to do some research into mobile communication systems. Um, where at that point, um, until 2008, there was no implementation of any of the uh, protocols or functional entities in uh, as free and open source software. And um, even, let's say, if you do this in an academic context, you would find uh, it quite hard to find universities that have a test lab with all the required equipment. Um, so I'm in Germany, I know two universities that had uh, a full GSM network uh, in there um, on, on like in at the university. Um, but uh, even if they do, well, then all the equipment is black boxes. So you can basically say, okay, well, this is the black box that implements the MSC and there is another black box that implements something else. And then you can do some protocol sniffing on the interfaces between those black boxes, but still, it's not really all that exciting because you can't modify those black boxes. And the only chance you had at that time to do some research into uh, uh, cellular systems, mobile communications, is to partner with one of the large uh, companies that uh, build this equipment, let's say Ericsson, Huawei, ZTE, Nokia, Siemens Networks, and so on. Um, and then they put you under an NDA and uh, will profit from your research and uh, you still well yeah maybe you can do some interesting research but you can't really uh, publish all the results and um, so on so um, and if we compare these two sites um, basically the internet side with TCP IP the Ethernet uh, Wi-Fi and so on all those uh, uh, protocols and we look on the other hand side um, at the uh, cellular uh, world where uh, like GSM, GPRS, Edge, 3G, HSPA, LTE, all those different systems um, and generations out there, um, you will find that the specifications of both of those worlds are always open uh, and publicly available. So um, if you want to learn about TCP IP, you can read the RFCs. If you want to learn about Ethernet, you can read the IEEE specs. Um, if you want to learn about GSM, you can go to the Etsy or to the 3GPP websites uh, where you can find a comprehensive body of standards and specifications and you can learn about them. So um, the documentation for both of those worlds or for systems and protocols in both of those worlds has been public for a long time. But yet, if you look on the internet side, you have all this innovation and, and all kinds of people doing interesting research 
and also going beyond just like research into functionality going into security for example all the the journey that the internet world has had you know from from ping of death to to a dos attacks to all those uh, and and much more comprehensive attacks these days um, uh, all that has not happened um, until uh, a couple of years ago and is still not happening to that extent in the cellular sphere. And um, the reasons I find for this is because while the industry um, in the cellular world is extremely closed and I have to add uh, closed minded in many cases, um, and uh, you find very few protocol stack implementations, proprietary of course, all of them, and the chipset makers, talking about the handset side now, um, are uh, not releasing any documentation on the hardware. So even if you say, well, okay, I, I move away all this proprietary protocol stack, I'm not interested in it, I want to write my own, you don't get the documentation that's needed to understand the hardware to the extent that you can actually implement your own protocol stack on top of it. So the only choice you have is to do reverse engineering, which means you spend an awful amount of time doing things which are not the, those things that you really wanted to do, which is implementing a protocol stack or even um, uh, uh, doing security research or any kind of research. So um, now uh, some people think about, oh yeah, all this research and uh, particularly from a security point of view in uh, telephony, who is interested in listening to phone calls? I mean, we all know the government can do it anyway. We all know there is uh, a lawful interception interfaces in all the cellular equipment out there um, that's documented and specified and there are laws around it and so on and so on. But I think um, listening to phone calls is boring indeed uh, but there's much more interesting stuff out there uh, we have machine to machine communication um, we know that bmw cars can be unlocked and locked using gsm um, it's not only bmw can do that unfortunately also other people can do it because they were not uh, very smart uh, when implementing that um, I'm not talking about the brand smart here um, there is uh, alarm systems that often burglar alarm systems that can be uh, uh, that either report over GSM or can be unlocked. Uh, there's of course smart metering. There is uh, one topic that I still haven't seen a lot of research in, which I think is a very interesting area, is railway GSM, uh, GSMR. Not sure how many people in this room realize that um, uh, railways and uh, basically permission to enter certain tracks and uh, the speed permit to, to run on certain tracks is com communicated by GSM, at least in some tracks in some countries in the, in the European Union and, and more and more of those tracks get converted to, to railway GSM. We have vending machines that re report if the cash box is full, so if you want to be smart and uh, a thief, then you could use, for example, such messages to <laughs> know where there is lots of coins in the cash boxes. There is entire um, wind uh, power plants, windmills that uh, are controlled over uh, GSM in the end. So whether they feed into the grid or not, um, just think about what it does to the grid once people can uh, uh, look at or um, uh, not look, but rather control such interfaces. We have transaction numbers for electronic banking that can transmit it over SMS and banks uh, sell that as a secure method of uh, authenticating. I mean, not sure what they had smoked when they make such a statement um, it's uh, to me it's ridiculous um, anyway so there's all kinds of interesting things from security point of view from just the technology point of view um, in uh, the cellular world and uh, there hasn't been much uh, free software so we started what's called the Osmocom project open source mobile communications uh, with uh, a typo um, uh, in the name um, and that's of course just my slide and my uh, inability to read the slides before presenting them. Um, and it's a classic collaborative uh, community driven uh, free software project. Um, so there's not a single company behind it, there is no dual licensing, there is no open core, there is uh, nothing. It's, it's uh, uh, mailing lists and people and code and uh, everything of it is released. And uh, Osmocom gathers uh, a number of people um, who explore uh, the, the, this world of, uh, that's very industry dominated and very closed in, in terms of uh, implementations and often also technology. Um, you can check out, of course, the website, 
yeah, we also have sour code, no, it's source code in Git. Um, we have lots of information in a wiki. Um, and uh, yeah, you can, you can check it out. And uh, there's many different projects inside the Osmocom project. So Osmocom is the umbrella project, and within Osmocom, we have many different projects. I don't even know the figure right now, but I would say it's probably two dozen or so uh, active projects at this, time, at this point. Um, uh, so it's a little bit, I mean, of course not in scale, but you think of like the Apache project. Well, yes, there is an Apache web server, but there's thousands of other projects that they, that they do under the umbrella. And uh, it's, it's a similar situation with Osmocom on a much smaller scale, of course. So um, the first project that was uh, publicized about and uh, that was released uh, is called OpenBSC. And it implements um, uh, what's called an ABIS interface towards what's called a BTS, a base transceiver station. So basically uh, using OpenBSC and uh, a base transceiver station for GSM, you can run your own cellular network. And that's, I'm going to talk about in a workshop uh, later at EMF camp. If you're interested in that, uh, feel free to check out that workshop. We're going to run through, through installing the software, configuring it, setting up the device, and actually getting to the point where you can run your own cellular network um, uh, with OpenBSC. Um, it has various different modes in which it can operate, um, but that goes into a lot of details on all the different acronyms and, and functional splits in, in the GSM architecture. It's deployed, well, it's uh, more than 200 now. I'm, I'm sure it's more than 500 uh, confirmed uh, installations that I know by now. But of course, well, it's a free software project. Anyone can download it, anyone can run it. I don't need to know about that. So it, there can be a much higher figure that we knew. So. As we are at a camp, actually this is a reminder to another camp that happened uh, a couple of years ago, the Hacking at Random Camp 2009. And the picture that you can see is at the bottom of the tree, there is two uh, 48 kilogram Siemens uh, base transceiver stations, mm, a couple of cables running up the tree, and you see the uh, red tape, well, not figuratively, the literal red tape around the antenna, um, taping the sector antennas to the tree. And that was the first uh, test installation that we ever did uh, with the OpenBSC software. So at the Hacking at Random camp um, in 2009, we were running a cellular network for participants of the camp, um, but also for us to basically have a real world test uh, for our implementation of those um, protocols. Um, this has been become sort of a tradition, so at other uh, events in, in the Netherlands or in, in uh, Germany at the, uh, the CCC camps, also at the congresses, we have been uh, coming back uh, every so often and uh, rerun this network, always with new features, new equipment, and so on. Um, so it can be used in several different um, uh, modes. Um, not going to go into too much detail here. Um, basically, one of the two modes enables you to run your base stations uh, as part of an existing cellular network. Well, if you're not a cellular operator, it's not a very interesting mode to you because, well, um, if you don't happen to have an existing cellular network, um, how do you integrate with it? Um, and the other mode, which is much more commonly used in the community, um, is uh, what we call the NITB, the network in the box. Um, and uh, that's basically, well, the name, as the name implies, all the elements that you need for a GSM network are implemented in one box. So you don't need all this complicated setup of, uh, you know, uh, half a dozen of different components and configure all the interfaces and so on. So it's just one program, you start it and you attach your, your, your transceiver hardware and that's it. So um, that's very suitable for private and private and or autonomous small networks uh, like a PBX, but with a wireless interface uh, for the actual uh, phone. Um, there is um, uh, no dependency on external components, uh, so you don't need anything else but this uh, OpenBSC uh, and the transceiver hardware. Um, you can, if you want to connect to the outside world using ISDN or VoIP or whatever you, you feel fit, basically we have an interface, how external how we call them MNCC handler, mobile network call control handlers can register. Um, you can interface that with asterisk, with free switch, with whatever you want. Um, there are some people who run this, for example, on offshore um, drilling rigs for oil and underground mining uh, as an alternative to PMR, professional mobile radio. Because while well, professional mobile radio has professional in the name, which means all the equipment is like 10 times more expensive. So if you can use inexpensive phones and 
GSM phones you can buy for ten dollars, twelve dollars these days. Um, it's actually a, a quite economic alternative to buying, you know, uh, two hundred, three hundred dollar uh, professional mobile radio uh, terminals. Even if the, the cheap phones break uh, uh, frequently, it's still going to be an economic uh, advantage. Um, it's also the configuration, this OpenBSC, um, uh, the, the NITB configuration, which is what you would use if you want to do security research or something into cellular technology. Um, we extended that over the time with um, uh, other network elements needed for GPRS, for packet switch communication, because GSM is actually, many people use GSM as a synonymous, uh, as synonymous for um, uh, any kind of cellular telephony that's not technically correct. GSM is the system that was originally described in the late 1980s and deployed first around 91, 92, if I remember correctly. And it's only about SMS and circuit switch te uh, telephony. There's no packet data in there. So we added uh, these SGSN and GGSN components which are needed to have a, a packet switched service, um, GPRS and Edge. Um, some people uh, may uh, still remember uh, that uh, these were the first um, uh, well, mobile data uh, systems out there in the cellular world. Um, and uh, using those components, um, well, the, the last sentence, I'm not so sure anymore. It's pretty stable and some people are using it actually in production, but still it's less uh, mature than the other components. So this, of course, once you have mobile data, um, you can, for example, test M2M devices doing that. Um, so if you develop a smart meter or develop some mobile device that includes a modem, um, then uh, testing against the real network, uh, and if something fails, well, you don't see what's really happening on the network. You don't get a protocol trace on the network, um, and you don't know was the network overloaded, was there bad reception, so you don't have a controlled test environment. But by using uh, your own uh, network, basically, you can do that. Mobile malware research, um, and of course, again, learning actually about the technology involved and all these protocol layers. Because if you think of a GPRS network, um, and you look at the protocol stack, I think there's like eight or nine layers below the IP that you as a user consume. Um, and you know, to me, as somebody who is into networking, if there's some protocol that I don't know about, I want to know about. So um, I'm interested in how these systems work and how those uh, uh, protocol stacks look like. Mm, that's, that's just my personal interest, but uh, there are other people out there who find it interesting to uh, uh, really learn about how these systems work and um, how they are designed and how they are different from other systems out there. And that's something you can do with uh, this stack. Okay, let's switch um, to another project which we have in the Osmocom project, which is the Osmocom BB project, where BB is for baseband, sort of not entirely correct, but the naming, you know, it's always uh, the last thing you think about. So um, what it is actually is uh, an implementation of all the software that you need to run a mobile phone, except the actual hardware um, transceiver. Um, so we, we reuse existing phone hardware, um, uh, specifically some older feature phones uh, that are sold under the Motorola brand and not actually built by Motorola. Um, and um, using such a phone, uh, basically we remove all the, or we ignore all the original software that's in there, all the binary only firmware that it ships with. Um, but we developed our own software from the drivers, the layer one, layer two, layer three, basically everything that you need to run inside the phone. And um, uh, using this, you can then from free software run a complete phone that you can register to an official network um, where you can make calls, do handover, uh, send SMSs, receive SMSs and so on. Well, okay, I can do that with the phone as it is. Why do I need Osmocom VB? Well, the difference is you can see everything that's going on and you can influence it, of course. So let's say you're somebody who is particularly um, cautious about not revealing his location. Um, with Osmocom BB, you can put an offset to all the transmissions so you appear to be further away from the cell and the network doesn't really know where you, re where you are anymore. These are the kind of things you can do once you control the technology, um, which you cannot do if you just use a black box and a proprietary protocol stack. Um, and of course, you can see everything that's going on. So uh, if you suspect something fancy going on, um, you have not only the protocol traces, but you, you can literally look at every part of the software. Um, so yeah, where is this being used? Well, it's mostly actually research and uh, um, uh, teaching or uh, studying. So 
um, applied security research. There's lots of people have been using this over the, the years. Um, for example, in uh, you can fuzz um, base stations or other parts of the cellular network because now for the first time with Osmocom BV, people can send malicious or intentionally malformed messages to any of those protocol stacks on the network side, um, which hasn't been the case before. So um, uh, basically uh, there, there were a lot of low hanging fruits in, in the uh, network implementations where, well, they just didn't think of what happens if a message is not malformed. So we like in the internet of the mid 1990s, the security mindset sort of, that's what you see in the cellular world. Um, there's uh, an attack called the RATCH denial of service, which is basically an overload of the initial um, process when you register to a cell, when you establish a channel to a cell um, that has been implemented um, and, and published uh, about that. Uh, so using Osmocom BB, it's easy to do that and to perform denial of service against cells. Um, you can check for all kinds of features which networks recently added to in increase or improve their security. So there's some random padding that has been rolled out by a lot of operators to combat some of the uh, A5 encryption uh, breaking um, and uh, you can check if a network actually uses that or not. You can also use this to do heuristics on detecting IMSI catchers or other false base stations uh, that might be in the vicinity. So if you're uh, worried about some evil attacker putting false base stations and trying to play man in the middle with uh, GSM, well, then Osmocom VB is a, is a very good uh, um, technology to um, look into what's really happening on a protocol level. And once again, well, yeah, you can study and learn how this works. Okay, well, that's um, basically uh, a lot of GSM-related projects. Let's look at, um, well, actually, yeah, Osmo BTS uh, very quickly about this slide. So, so far I've been talking about um, well, you need this base station, and at this camp in 2009, we used the Siemens base station, so there's still a proprietary element in this chain. With Osmo BTS, we also implemented the actual BTS itself in software, so you can now use a combination of different software components, including Osmo BTS and the network in the box, and something else that's called Osmo TRX, um, uh, and run that on a software-defined radio, and then run your entire base station out of software-defined radio. At that point, you don't have any proprietary um, uh, software involved anymore, and no firmware or anything that's uh, a closed source at that point. Um, okay, that was all GSM and related technology. Um, now there's many other projects in the Osmocom Umbrella project um, that look at different mobile uh, um, or cellular technologies. Um, one is called Osmocom Tetra, which is an implementation of the Phi and Mac layers of uh, Tetra, which is uh, terrestrial trunk radio, um, which is used, for example, by uh, police all over Europe uh, for communication. But no, you cannot listen into police uh, with the Osmocom Tetra because they use normally, at least uh, if they deployed it correctly, strong end-to-end -end encryption. But there are many other networks, let's say at airports or chemical plants or ports, or I mean seaports or something like that, um, where they run Tetra as a professional mobile radio system um, and they don't use any of the security features. So there's no authentication and no um, uh, encryption involved. Um, so using Osmocom Tetra, for example, uh, in, in Berlin, in my home city, you can tap into the radio of the subway. So you can basically listen to the subway radio. And there's also a network by Vattenfall, the local electricity utility company, um, where um, there's not much traffic going on, but I, I think they are using or pre having, they have this network in for disaster cases. So basically, whenever all the other communication channels should break down in case of a bigger disaster, that the utility company can still communicate uh, with uh, people in the field trying to fix the grid or something like that. Um, in Hamburg, there is a network um, uh, that includes the Hamburg port, and there are several airports in Germany which have completely unencrypted open Tetra communication. And then the, you know, we think about all the, you know, the, the body scanners and, and all the security uh, simulation that they do to the passengers, and then on the other hand, all their internal communication is completely public to anyone, and they don't put even encryption or authentication there, which is specified, but they're just too lazy to actually deploy it. So, um, like on the airport, you can listen to everything that's going on, uh, not between the planes and the airport, where they use regular, uh, regular airband AM, 
but uh, it's about the staff on the ground, um, the coordination, which vehicles go where, the buses and so on. That's basically what's communicated there. So using Osmocom Tetra, you can um, do protocol analysis on Tetra and, and uh, also decode uh, the voice uh, that's in there. Uh, the receiver is fully implemented. Transmitter is only a partial implementation. We never even really bothered to do real transmission. The transmitter implementation basically only served as a test case against the receiver, so we could verify the receiver without having a, a third-party uh, signal. Um, yeah, so there is some uh, Wireshark dissectors merged into Wireshark, so you also get a, a, a protocol uh, decode um, like you would get in, in, in a TCP IP network. Yeah, so what to use this for? Well, for analysis, assessment of network security, learning how Tetra works, um, and so on. Um, Actually, uh, the code has been extended um, uh, to also, there's also like a cellular data over Tetra, so something like GPRS for Tetra, um, and uh, that also gets fully decoded. And you actually see some, like in, in those networks that I've looked at, you see IP communication going over this. Um, there's other projects in the Osmocom umbrella. One is called um, the Osmocom GMR. Uh, GMR is, as everyone in here certainly knows, the Geo Mobile Radio, um, which is uh, uh, one of these acronyms from ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standardization Institute, about uh, satellite radio or satellite uh, telephony. So. Um, I was just kidding, I guess nobody here heard about GMR before, but um, Thuraya, some people might have heard before, it's one of the commercial operators operating a satellite telephony network using the GMR1 standard. And the Osmocom GMR project implements uh, an SDR-based radio modem and Phi and Mac layer for receive. So uh, basically this means you can, uh, using a, a suitable antenna, um, which is relatively easy to, to, to build, um, and an SDR and Osmocom GMR, you can get the, the protocol traces of the, um, uh, of the decoder. The speech codec by now, sorry if the slide is outdated, is, is implemented, so it's, uh, it is proprietary, but the reverse engineering on the speech codec has been done, so you can actually um, tap into calls. There's also some work not done within the Osmocom project on breaking the encryption, um, and there is a re reverse engineered implementation of the well, encryption in quotes um, they put on, on this system. So it's uh, even weaker than the GSM encryption uh, you have on land. Hmm. Um, yeah, so well, again, use cases, well, not really any, anything beyond uh, looking at the security, learning about the technology um, and uh, intercepting communication. There's also a project about DECT, the Digital European Cordless Telephony, um, which has been broken uh, many years before. Osmocom even, there was a project called Dedected.org, um, which uh, uh, discovered security issues in the cordless telephony standard. And Osmocom DECT is an implementation of uh, hardware drivers and protocol stacks inside the Linux kernel. So if you compile that um, and have the right hardware in place, you can um, actually serve as a, as a PBX and have uh, all the, the DECT uh, stack in, in uh, free software. A similar project for OP25, which is uh, APCO25, which is a, a professional PMR system used in the US, again, by police and, and uh, other public authorities. It can be compared on the same uh, like feature level and, and so on technology like Tetra mm. in Europe. And uh, there's a, a project again for an SDR-based receiver and protocol analyzer. So it's pretty much the same just for yet another communication system. We also did an Osmocom SDR um, uh, quite some time ago, um, but then basically um, RTL SDR happened and uh, nobody was interested in Osmo SDR anymore. Um, and I'm going to get to RTL SDR in the next uh, slide. But it's a, it's a small um, uh, USB SDR hardware that we built um, with a higher bandwidth that at that time available, the FunCube Dongle Pro, much lower cost than USRP. And um, yeah, we, we made it, I think, to like 20 or 50 units. And then, uh, yeah, it sort of, the timing was bad. Because, well, luckily, and I'm very happy about that, um, RTL SDR happened, um, which is also the, the actual source code for RTL SDR uh, is developed in the Osmocom project. And um, what uh, some of you may have heard or seen this before, even use one. It's basically, uh, there are some cheap uh, DVB-T USB receivers uh, that you can uh, buy at a very low cost. 
Um, and these devices normally they have a tuner that down converts the signal from the RF uh, into um, into uh, ion Q baseband and analog baseband. And then you have an ADC which also integrates the DVB decoder, so uh, all the demodulation and so on and so on. Um, but uh, through some special commands, the the DVB decoder can be disabled, and you can forward the raw samples into the PC. And then basically, it means you can turn one of those consumer-grade receivers into a, a software-defined radio that you can use to receive pretty much anything that's within the frequency range and the bandwidth um, of uh, this device. And the software for actually talking uh, to uh, the hardware and implementing the drivers for it and so on is what we call lib RTL SDR um, in the Osmocom project. There is another project also closer to hardware, which is Osmocom SimTrace which is uh, hardware and firmware and software for protocol tracing of the interface between SIM card and phone. Um, so if you ever were interested for whatever weird reason um, in the communication between your SIM card and a phone, or actually any contact-based smart card and its reader, because it's always the same standard that's used. So some people are also using this to look at EMV payment cards uh, using the SIM trace, because it's the same physical interface. So it works, as you can see in the picture, you insert uh, a SIM card adapter with a flex cable into the actual phone. We also have these for the micro and nano SIM cards, not just for the large ones. Um, and the actual SIM card then gets put into um, the, uh, the PCB. There's a SIM card reader uh, where the SIM card um, is inserted. And then there's a microcontroller on the board which uh, sniffs the communication going back and forward between SIM card and uh, the phone. And there's a USB port on the other side, so you basically can get the protocol traces into the PC, where once again they are fed into Wireshark, and we have a Wireshark decoder for uh, the SIM card uh, related protocol. So um, in uh, it's also possible using this hardware to do man in the middle or a SIM card emulation. Um, it's just the software is not uh, complete in that part. Uh, the software implementation only for card emulation and for um, uh, tracing has been uh, fully completed, man, the middle, uh, I think there were some patches at the mailing list at some point, but it's not uh, really integrated. So about SimTrace, uh, there's also going to be a workshop um, at EMF Camp. If you're interested in playing with this and in tracing SIM card communication, um, feel free to attend this workshop. Um, I have 10 devices uh, with me, so we can have some fun with those. Um, Maybe one more thing to why would anyone do this? Aside again from, well, I want to understand this protocol and this interface and how it works. Well, um, there are a lot of things that a SIM card can do to a phone which most people are not aware of. A SIM card can request f the GPS position from the phone, for example. Why would a SIM card ever need to know that? A SIM card can um, send SMSs by itself using the phone uh, where the user has no idea that those messages are being sent. Um, a SIM card can do all kinds of other things um, uh, which is not presented to the regular user of a mobile phone and um, that's why doing protocol analysis can be quite interesting to see really what's, what's using this and what's happening in uh, this communication. We also did another small hardware project and there's many more of these. I'm not going to go through all of them. One is an E1 transceiver which is, uh, well, if you ever uh, are in need of interfacing with a physical E1 or T1 line, that's a synchronous uh, uh, system uh, which is used a lot in GSM base stations. That's why we implemented it. We uh, build a small board for that. Um, there is protocol stack implementations in Erlang. If anyone here fancies Erlang as a programming language, normally in all the other Osmocom projects we use low level C, no C++. Uh, uh, but here is uh, some projects in Erlang that um, implement uh, various protocol stacks that are used in cellular networks. I'm not going to go into the details here, but uh, if you're interested in the core network protocols which are spoken on the roaming interfaces between the cellular operators, these are the protocols basically that are used in those interfaces and we have these uh, implementations. So um, there are some smaller MVNOs, virtual network operators that don't have their own uh, radio network, their own physical network, but they only operate a core network and uh, some of them actually use this code um, for some of the functional elements they need. There is more Osmocom projects. I'm sure the number 79 is outdated now. I didn't do a recount before uh, uh, today, but there's lots of public Git repositories there um, and uh, way more than I can cover in this talk. 
Um, often, I mean, in the larger projects or the more more frequently used ones, you will find a wiki and uh, and some documentation. But some of them, there's basically just a Git repository. It's because somebody needed to write some code um, and put it in there. So it is sometimes RTFS, and there is no um, manual or documentation. But then you can always come to the project mailing lists and um, uh, discuss questions that you have. Finally, a couple of slides about non-OSMOCOM projects, which are also related to open source mobile communications. I just want to name them because I think uh, they're also important if you have an interest in mobile communications. There is what's called OpenBTS. Don't mistake it with OSMOBTS that I presented earlier. OSMOBTS is an OSMOCOM project, OpenBTS is not. Um, OpenBTS is um, uh, functionally best described as a UM to SIP bridge. UM is the radio interface between your phone and the cell tower, and SIP, well, SIP is voice over IP telephony, so it is a, um, a very quick and direct bridge between this radio interface and SIP. So if you don't want to bother with all of these deep protocol stacks and all these strange acronyms and all the complex architecture of GSM, this is a very quick way how to attach a cellular phone to a voice over IP system. Um, there is another project also slightly outdated and unmaintained these days called AirProbe, which is a, a SDR implementation, again, for the GSM radio interface, um, which predates OSMOCOM and, and all of the other work that I presented today. Um, and uh, But you can use it any using SDR hardware like a USRP or something like that. Um, uh, you can use it to uh, demodulate um, and... Um, decode uh, the radio interface um, of GSM and then uh, um, uh, feed it again into Wireshark for protocol analysis. It's not so much used these days anymore because you can do the same with Osmocom BB and Osmocom BB you need a small inexpensive phone and you have an excellent decoder and when you use AirProbe you need a very expensive SDR and you have a very poor um, software decoder so you had to uh, get lots of bit errors and, and, and frames just because the quality of the decoder implemented in AirProbe is not as good as the one in the DSP of the uh, phone so uh, that's why it's a bit abandoned. There is another project called UMTRX which is an SDR hardware project specifically for the GSM radio interface which you can use with either OpenBTS or OsmoBTS it's an open hardware design, so you can also check that out. Um, and uh, finally, one last project that I find very interesting is uh, Xgoldmon, which is uh, basically a software for phones that are based on the Xgold chipset. That's uh, formerly Infineon, now Intel um, series of uh, GSM baseband processors that's used in some phones. You can see like uh, Samsung Galaxy S3, S2, Galaxy Note 2, and so on. Um, they use this chipset and there is some uh, undocumented commands by which over USB you can basically enable tracing in the phone and then you get all the uh, low level messages uh, from uh, the GSM radio interface or not just GSM but also 3G radio interface um, over USB feed them into your PC where you run Xgoldmon which then feeds it into a Wireshark again and you can uh, again look at protocol traces and observe and uh, analyze uh, what the phone is doing in terms of the network. Okay, well, where do we go from here? That's sort of the wrap up uh, of all the various different projects. Um, our team member Dieter has been working a lot with 3G Notebees um, from Ericsson and Nokia. Um, the goal is also to run our own uh, RNC with those base stations. We meanwhile also have implemented um, what's called a home node B gateway. So with certain femto cells, uh, you can now also run your own 3G network, uh, similar to the network in the box for 2G and 2.5G. Um, uh, there's some research into intercepting microwave backhaul links because um, a lot of the microwave backhaul links that are between uh, uh, cellular base stations are unencrypted again and they're only protected by, well, some proprietary encoding. Um, there's research into GPS simulation um, and uh, some ongoing effort of uh, OSMOCOM BB with other baseband chips or with SDR because the phones that we originally developed for are increasingly hard to find these days. Um, try to find a phone from 2007, you have to go to a museum these days. Um, uh, you can still find them, but it's getting increasingly uh, difficult. Um, there is, well, the femtocell work I already spoke about, and um, uh, there's some research into proprietary PMR systems, um, and uh, yeah, many many other people looking at interesting uh, communication systems out there. 
Um, and I think uh, it's important that uh, we understand those communication systems and they're not just controlled and understood by very few large corporations on this planet. Yeah, so if you tend to agree that, well, on A, classic internet TCP IP is boring because it has been researched to death and everyone learns about it at university or even in school. So um, there are many, many, many other communication systems out there. And uh, never trust the industry um, in terms of any kinds of claims regarding safety or uh, privacy of those systems. Uh, always have a look yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's important we can democratize access to those communication systems and to the related uh, projects. So yeah, um, if you have an interest in any of these areas, please uh, contribute to the project, start your own projects. Uh, join the mailing lists, and uh, yeah, let's proceed that way. Okay, that's a thanks slide. I'm not going to read the names, um, and uh, yeah, we have time for questions. So um, there's, uh, I can't see, but there's supposed to be somebody with a microphone. Yeah, over there, in indeed. So if you want to raise questions, please uh, wait for the microphone and uh, ask a question in the microphone for the recording. Um, yeah, I can't see very well, so wave, please. Oh, hello. Hey there. Do you have any concern that anything you're doing might get you in any trouble at all? <laughs> um, I don't really have much of a concern. Um, in the sense that research into all these topics, there is nothing illegal about it. Of course, if you use it to actually intercept systems, then that is, depending on the national law and where you are and the jurisdiction and so on, might have an issue. But I mean, my standard response is, well, um, if I manufacture a hammer, it can be used for, you know, uh, nailing nails into the wall or you can smash somebody's head with a hammer. And um, it's sort of just because there are many useful cases of using a hammer, we shouldn't outlaw hammers just because they can also be used to create damage. So it's maybe not a very nice analogy, but um, that's sort of my attitude to that. Um, and um, I mean, all the tools that I'm talking about, they all exist for the internet, but they didn't or don't exist to that extent for other systems. And I mean, the internet also is alive. And um, yes, there are criminals online as there are criminals in the real world, as there are criminals who want to do something fancy in cellular networks. So. Yeah, hi, very interesting talk. Um, I have two small questions. Um, the first one is, what's the cost of getting a BTS, more or less, if um, you do know? It depends. Um, I mean, uh, sometimes, so if you want to get um, an existing proprietary BTS of like from, from a manufacturer, uh, like, then uh, you can sometimes on eBay or other online sales, you can find uh, pretty cheap. So I've heard some people like for 100, 120 euros sometimes. You have to be lucky oh. for that. If you want to go for SDR, well, I think like 500 to six, uh, $600 uh, dollars you can get a, a, an SDR that's capable of doing that. Um, uh, you attach it over USB to a PC and then you run all the software on the PC. Um, if you want to buy a new base station um, from a manufacturer, then of course it's going to be more expensive. But uh, yeah, so. Okay, and the other part of the question would be, uh, is it actually legal to run one of the base station? Um, that depends on where you are um, and uh, whether you uh, manage to get permission from the regulatory body or not. Um, in many countries, it's possible to get uh, what is often called as non-operational or non-commercial or test or experimental licenses. I don't know how Ofcom in the UK is handling this but um, uh, at least it would be worth uh, approaching them about this. So if you say, well, you know, I'm doing some research in, into cellular communications and so on, and you want to have a, a, an experimental license, it, I'm not sure uh, what would be the response. I know there is a procedure in, in every regulatory authority has a procedure for that. Um, and um, yeah, so unfortunately there is no um, license free spectrum that anyone can just use um, uh, except if you're in the Netherlands. So the Netherlands has uh, a couple of channels in the GSM 1800 spectrum, which is license-free, um, but that's a peculiarity of the Netherlands. I'm not aware of any other country where this is the case. 
Um, if you want to play with this technology and not really want to run a network, um, then what you can do is you can connect the components over coaxial wiring with attenuators. Um, it's not so exciting if you have a, a wireless phone with a wire coming out of it. But uh, still, if you want to do some research into this, um, it's a perfectly valid setup. And then you're not broadcasting. You're just feeding the signals over coaxial cable. That's sort of the, the, the last resort that you can do. And so how quickly do you catch up with, because you know, you're talking about trying to reverse engineer and everything, and how quickly do you catch up with things, and how quickly do they come up with new things that you'd have to then you know, reverse engineer again? Well, um, the reverse engineering, we haven't really, um, we haven't really done so much. It depends on, on the protocol <coughs> or the system that you want to look at. I mean, I said for this commercial cellular networks uh, like uh, GSM to LTE, basically, all of them, all the specs are out there. So if you have an SDR and you want to implement something, um, you don't need to reverse engineer anything. Uh, but if you want to work with an existing phone or if you buy an Ericsson BTS of eBay, and want to interface it, and of course Ericsson has modified some bits here and there to make it nice and easy for you to use it. Um, and um, so there's like uh, some additional work required. But in general, it's not so much, I mean, about catching up, uh, I think is not so much related to um, the proprietary bits in the technology, but it's more related to the pace of the development. Um, so. Uh, I mean, these days, of course, everyone talks, of everyone in the industry, I mean, even LTE is old for them. They're talking about LTE advanced. They're talking about 5G systems where you have 120 megahertz wide channels up to 30 gigahertz or something absurd like that. Um, and um, that's, that's what they are working on. That's what they are looking into. Um, and of course, with every new generation, um, a new technology and probably a more complex technology gets introduced and uh, lots of people are required to implement that as free software if, if needed. But um, how can I say with LTE, it's slightly different because there actually is um, an open source LTE um, terminal side implementation. So using a USRP or another software defined radio and a reasonably powerful Intel, like a Core i7, uh, Core i5 kind of CPU, you can actually run the entire LTE um, physical layer and protocol stack in your in software in in uh, free software on your PC, and you, you can transmit I think about 50 to 70 megabits um, uh, through that. So it's actually quite useful. Um, uh, that's not something that has happened in the Osmocom project, but still, I mean, there are people doing free software in in those technologies, even if they are more advanced than than the 20-year-old uh, GSM that we started to look into. Okay, and what questions we got? Um, uh, chap over here, and I'll come over to the back there. Uh, yes, uh, say if you're, for example, uh, experiencing intermittent issues between two commercial operators, uh, which Osmocom tools can actually help you debug and find out which operator messed up? Between two operators, so you're talking about roaming situations. Yes. Uh, you cannot debug that unless you can tap into the interface between those operators. <laughs> But can you at least see that uh, one of the operators actually cooperated or uh, well had, uh, had less problems than the other? Or um, It's difficult. I mean, you can do one of these, uh, I mean, Absolutely. tracing on the device. So uh, if you trace, um, uh, let, let's say using Xgoldmon or something like that, you can, you can take a protocol trace of what your device is doing towards the network and you observe that in, in, in an operator where it works and in another operator where it doesn't work, um, then maybe you can get some conclusions on where the problem might be. But if it's roaming, then I think it's very hard to get any results without actually being able to look at the, the core network of the operator. Okay, who's over here? What's the current state of the art in femtocell hacking? <laughs> um, it's not so, okay, uh, how can I say? Well, um, there are some femtocells, um, I'm not going to name them yet, um, where there has been made a lot of progress and where we could actually um, convince the femtocell to talk to our own network and our own network implementation and there's going to be some news later this year about this. Um, the problem with most femtocells is that uh, 
by today they have reasonably good security in their um, uh, in in their system. So the the idea of a femtocell is that uh, basically you get a small cell into your home, but this cell uh, establishes an IPsec tunnel to the operator that has issued or that has given you that femtocell, and then this cell becomes part of the radio access network of this operator. So um, you have this for, for a good coverage in your home. Now, if you want to use it from your own network, well, first of all, you need your own network implementation. We did that with the, the Osmo IOH and the um, uh, Home Node B gateway that we implemented. So from the protocol side, uh, uh, the implementations exist now. Um, uh, but what you still need to do is basically you need to somehow root the cell locally um, and make it uh, either install your own certificate for the IPsec so it connects to your own IPsec gateway or disable IPsec altogether so that it just connects over plain TCP to your, um, to your network implementation. And uh, some people have tried this with um, Huawei uh, femtocells, um, UAP2105 or something like that. And there, the, the main problem was that, uh, well, as there was one specific Russian uh, firmware version where it was very easy to circumvent all the, the, uh, the, the lockdown, basically. But all the other firmware versions that you find um, in the devices uh, that you can find online on eBay or something like that, they are uh, secured and um, a serial console and, and JTAG and that stuff has been disabled. So that's uh, not so interesting. Uh, there are some older femtocells which have less security in a sense of physical security. So like the, the original um, um, Vodafone, I'm not sure how they called it here in, in the UK. I was even, I think 2009, 2010, sorry? On. on? No, I think it was called different back then, but anyway. Um, okay, maybe it was called Vodafone on, but they were the first in Europe, I think, to, to deploy femtocells. And if you look at those, um, it's very easy to break into them and to root them, but they predate all the standardized femtocell protocols. So basically, you need a different, you need to speak a different protocol to talk to them. It's a proprietary um, a protocol and not the later standardized IUH protocol. So you basically have modern femtocells that are very hard to break in, which speak a standardized protocol for which there is code, or you have old femtocells where you can break in easily, but which don't speak a protocol that's interoperable and documented. So not so nice, the situation. All right, I think that might be it for questions. Uh, let's get rid of the next speaker, but uh, thank you, Howard. That's very interesting. Thank you so much.